Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Mastering Midlife, How to Thrive When the World Asks the Most of You. I'm your host, Mark Silverman. Today, I have the honor of speaking with Dr. Diane Hamilton, and that, uh, Dr. Hamilton is a media star. She is uh, out there in ways that I am learning to do so. I'm really excited. She's a nationally syndicated radio host, speaker, moderator, consultant, and educator. She has a PhD in business, taught more than 1,000 business courses, and is an expert in curiosity, emotional intelligence, engagement, and other behavior and cultural based issues that impact workplace performance. She just wrote a book called The Curiosity, uh, Cracking the Curiosity Code, The Key to Unlocking Human Potential, and has invented an assessment that helps you determine your curiosity. It's all of that, and the reason I read it was it was all of that that I asked her to be on the show because you know those of us who are in our 40s, 50s, and 60s are wrestling with our careers and how to evolve. And there was, there was just a myriad of subjects that we could talk about. So Diane, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me on the show. I'm looking forward to this. I appreciate it. And I'm, I, you know, I love having the consummate professional. I've been following <laughs> your work uh, and, and people that I can learn from to be a better podcaster and better communicator. So this is, this is really fun for me. Well, it's early, you know, you don't know what I might do on your show yet. So <laughs> I, I love, I love the, unex I love the unexpected. Yeah. So you've done everything from emotional intelligence, career reinvention. Now you're talking about curiosity. Uh, you've spoken to some of the most famous business leaders in the world. And yeah. given, given the subject matter that we're talking about is, is, you know, basically evolving. We were joking before we started the show that those of us with the gray hair and the beard like me, uh, we, we're still going to compete on the playing field with the gelled hair younger guys, but we need to be wiser. We need to be smarter and we need to raise our game in a different way. How have you been seeing that for the people that you work with? Well, I think men have it actually easier than women in that age group. Uh, I think as men uh, have aged uh, to a certain level of the Gen X and up and the boomer generation, it's not as uh, hard on them sometimes as for women. And I've had a lot of women talk about that on the show, but I, I think it's hard for both groups. And I think that it's hard because a lot of uh, boomers are hanging in to jobs a lot longer than they were in the past. And so a lot of people covet those jobs who are younger. So there's that pressure of, uh, you know, how long are you going to hang around? I'd like your job kind of thing. <laughs> so, you know, and, and it's understandable. And actually I was talking to one of my guests yesterday as a lot of women are stepping down, they're not being replaced by more women. And so they're having even more issues trying to get older women into some of those jobs. But um, I, I think though, we've had more generations working together now than ever in the past. And so we've had more issues in general. And I think every generation feels its sense of, well, I don't fit in a way. I mean, I don't think it's just the older generation that feels this way. I think millennials feel the pressure to be a certain way, just the way a boomer feels a certain way. But with that said, uh, all of, a lot of it boils down to having the ability to um, build empathy and interpersonal skills and have self uh, awareness and all that is tied into emotional intelligence. And as you mentioned at the beginning, um, I have an emotional intelligence expert to some extent. I wrote my dissertation on emotional intelligence and in one of my books uh, about personalities uh, included components of emotional intelligence. In my most recent book, I discussed the relationship of intelligence to curiosity. And in my work now with perception and some of the other things I'm working on, emotional intelligence is just so intertwined with everything, with culture, with uh, generational conflict. You just name it. If you, if you can work on emotional intelligence, you, you get a lot further in, in life. And I think that uh, I've had a lot of experts on my show, everybody from like Lolly Daskal to, you know, any consultant on my show that deals with leader who deals with leaders, I should say, has uh, at one time or another, they, they address that this, uh, a lot of leaders feel this imposter syndrome that somebody's going to figure out that I don't know as much as I'm supposed to know and that I'll, I, I should be smarter. And uh, so, you know, I got all these cars, I got this house, I got all this stuff to take care of. I got all this pressure and they build all this in their head that they have to be bigger and better than they are and you're, everybody's just human everybody feels the same way and I think that that's why I really enjoyed having um, Keith Kroc on my show he wrote the foreword for my book and he is the former chairman and CEO of DocuSign 
Mm. And he's uh, probably in his 60s. I'm not sure. Low 60s, probably. And he's, but he seems so young and he seems so with it when it comes to understanding how to get along with all, all people in all generations. He's probably the most humble guy who's, you know, a billionaire. He's got everything. And he could be acting, you know, like I'm above it all. And he acts the exact opposite way. He says, Hey, I don't know everybody, anything. I, I, I hire these people and I surround myself. And I, and I think that that's such a great quality that a lot of leaders um, don't do. They don't act you know, like they want to seem like they know it all so that they won't be discovered that they, they have something, some piece missing that they should have. But everybody's got pieces missing. We're all, you know, just, you know, working with everybody else. And I think it's building emotional intelligence can be one of the, the key components of not feeling that way. Yeah, that that's, that's makes so much sense. So, so let's say Simon Sinek and Brene Brown have made vulnerability vogue. Mm-hmm right? So uh-huh. it's, okay to, it's okay to talk about that kind of stuff now. Draw, uh-huh. draw me a line from what they're talking about with vulnerability to how you, how you see emotional intelligence. Well, I think it's an admission that you don't know everything is somewhat, um, you know, you could look at it as being vulnerable or just realistic, you know what I mean? And I, th- I love both of those authors. And I used a lot of Simon's work when I was researching uh, Curiosity. He's always in defining your why, and that's a very important thing. And Mel, she's really fun and entertaining, and I love her style and everything she talks about. It, it's all mind over um, just our, oh, it, it's that self-talk. And I, I address that a lot in um, my curiosity code index that I created to go along with the book. I found that four factors kept people from being curious, and their fear, assumptions, technology, and environment. So if you look at assumptions, that's really what you're telling yourself. It's that speak, mm. that voice in your head saying, I'm not going to like this, or I'm not going to be good enough at this. I'm going to, you know, it's going to be too hard. It's not going to be interesting. And I think that if you recognize that, you, you know, you can call it being vulnerable, or you can just say, you know, it's just human to have certain levels of expectations, certain levels of environmental impact certain, you know, I mean, teachers, family, everything influences us it, it, all the way along. And if I took you and cloned you right now and put you in a different family or same family, you'd still come out differently because you have new people and experiences and things. So I think you have to factor in all these things and not be so hard on yourself. I have a lot of mindfulness coaches and I'm one of those people I hear mindfulness and I'm not exactly the most calm person. And I was teasing Daniel Goleman was on my show, who's the famous author, of course, of all the emotional intelligence books. And he's now dealing with a book he wrote called uh, Altered Traits, which is more about mindfulness. And as I'm listening to his book, getting ready for the show, I realize I'm listening to it at double speed to hurry up and get through it because I want to hurry up to interview him. Everything in my world is super, super fast. I'm not the person that sits and meditates in the corner. And his book was like, you know, you got to slow down and listen. And, and, I'm, and I told him when he's on the show, I'm, I'm listening to your thing on double speed. I felt like such an idiot <laughs> doing it. Slow, you know? slow down, but slow down fast. <laughs> slow down fast. I don't think I've ever listened to an audio book on regular speed because I multitask and do all the things they tell you not to do. But uh, I, I think what they are trying to get to you know, explained, and I got a lot of it from Daniel, and I got a lot of it from Dr. Ellen Langer from um, Harvard about, you know, you just, she's the mother of mindfulness, and he's, you know, basically the father of emotional intelligence together, you know, and I'm listening to all these great pieces of wisdom on my show, and I I think it's not like you you can't, I think Daniel put it like, you know, you're not going to empty your mind and just be sitting there without any thoughts. Of course, you're going to have thoughts. It's, it's, it's taking time to sit there for a few minutes and um, just be aware when your thoughts start going to negative places. And, and I thought that that was kind of helpful for somebody like me, who is not like a meditative type of person who thinks about all this stuff, you know, I think you have to just go, okay, come back, pull yourself, you know, reel it in that this is starting to, to get a little off course. You're starting to think too much about things that are probably problematic. And, and it all ties, ties back to emotional intelligence and, just that self-awareness of how, what you're thinking, what your self-talk is and how you, um, if you have to know yourself to understand how to get along with us 
And you may be thinking millennials or Gen Xers or whatever group you don't like or whatever it is, you know, but they all are thinking the same thing. Everybody's the same. You can't lump people into a category. Everybody's an individual person that has their unique needs. And we're all wanting to get along in our own way. And, it, and I think it's all about developing all those interpersonal skills. But to develop interpersonal skills, you have to really understand you know, your self-talk and, and have real self-awareness. And um, all of that builds empathy. And empathy is a big part of emotional intelligence, being able to put yourself in somebody else's uh, shoes. And, you know, I've been in sales, decades of sales, uh, and I understand the importance of all this to sales. And I know you probably have quite a few people here in sales. And uh, you, you know, sales has changed considerably. I mean, I was in pharmaceuticals forever. I was in lending, mortgages, real estate. I've been in all kinds of the sales component. but it used to be I was alone as a salesperson they three the yellow page that said dial for dollars whatever it was it, there was no teams it was me there's your zip code have fun you know and it, it's so different now you've got people running teams and you've got to, you have to deal with personalities and, and it, it's not just you anymore and you have to learn how to play nice and you can't just take your toys and go home you have to stick it out and it, it's a little uh, challenging for people, but it, it, there's good, good things and bad things because it takes away the pressure of everything being on you. You have a support team, but then you have to learn how to get along with other people. And, uh, and I've done a lot of training with different personality tests from you know, the Myers-Briggs to DISC, to all the different types of personality assessment tests. And it does help to take those because you kind of understand, you, you kind of know what you are, right? I mean, if you don't know what you are, that's kind of unusual. Usually if you're taking a self-assessment, you're answering the questions, you know what you are. But what I think is the most important thing about that is that you can know what other people are when you find out what the opposite things are of what you are. And uh, like, if you find out you're an extrovert, you learn about introverts. And if you find out, you know, mm -hmm. you use your senses and somebody else uses intuition you find out the opposite of what you are and I think those tests are great for that I did something different with my assessment on curiosity because I think curiosity is the spark that leads to all the things that Simon Sinek's writing about with uh, motivation that uh, you know all these books about motivation creativity uh, you name it critical thinking anything you're trying to develop keeps coming back to curiosity but when I was measuring it I'm like well I don't really want to measure like a disc or a Myers-Briggs or something where they put you into these boxes, these categories. I wanted to figure out how to help people who lack the ability to really ask questions and pose solutions and be aligned to really great jobs that maybe would make them more engaged. And, and so um, a lot of people are just feeling kind of this frustration that they don't really like their jobs. They're not totally engaged. We, we know the numbers from Gallup. I mean, we have horrific amount of um, disengagement we also are spending hundreds of billions a year on this so i wanted to get back to that what, so, what so, so, so just for a quick second why is it that we have record number of disengagement well there's a lot of things that they have found people don't really know how what they do ties into uh, the overall goals of the organization so they don't even know you know they're doing a job and there's just no meaning because they have no vision no mission no, you know they just have tasks sometimes it just depends on what it is there's lack of communication there's lack of alignment a lot of people are in jobs that just don't fit their their skills i've actually interviewed a lot of people like olin Odakovin was on my show and he um he would hire people and then create jobs for them later once you figure out what they're really good at. And I mean, I think they're starting to think. That's the, that's the, enlightened, that's the enlightened way to think about it. Yeah, this. it's probably an expensive way too. And that's why a lot of people can't do that. You know what I mean? But it's a great thing if you get somebody that does that for you. Um, but I think, you know, what I was trying to do when I was measuring curiosity was to figure out these factors that would help with engagement with all these things that we're talking about here that would help with uh, conflict resolution and you know just name it you ask leaders what their top issues are they're always going to list engagement and conflict and all these things so what i did is i measured how fear uh, assumptions technology and environment impact those issues and once you find out that, oh, okay, well, I don't want to say anything because I'm afraid somebody's going to think this, or I assume it's going to be that, or technology's doing it for me, or my uh, teachers never answered the questions. What do, what, do you, what do you mean that technology's doing it for me? Well, why, I could ask Google. Why, why research it? Why figure out the foundations? So why, you know what I mean? I, I don't, I, there's a calculator. I don't so know. In other words, why learn, how, why learn long <laughs> division because we have a calculator? 
basically, you know, I mean, we're losing a lot of the foundational aspects or we're losing just the reasoning, the critical thinking behind things. If you don't really put all those pieces together, um, it, it impacts your perception because critical thinking is a big impact uh, on that. So as we talk about perception, you know, we're talking about global issues, people getting together at, with cultural quotients and things everybody's measuring. I mean, there's just, there's emotional levels, there's cultural levels, there's critical thinking levels, there's all these physical IQ things that impact people. And that's the kind of stuff I study. And that's the kind of thing that I think that people who are kind of feeling uneasy and uh, like they've got it all, the house and the car and the things, but they're just like, why aren't I happy? A lot of them are, might be just missing uh, a couple of those pieces. You know, they, they maybe need some help with emotional intelligence. They may need help with aligning of the right job or tasks to what they're doing um, based on what curiosity level is that they haven't even explored because it was shut down by somebody in their past. And, and there's just so much um, personality-based things that I think are really fascinating to look at in, in terms of people who aren't happy. So I'm a man or a woman, uh... Uh, and I have, a, I have a good corporate job, good income, and I'm a little unhappy. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or uh, you know, I need to evolve. I've been, I've been told I need to network more. Or I need to build my personal brand. So that means I need to branch out and start to, start to market myself in uh -huh. a different way. So I need to go to networking meetings, God <laughs> forbid, you know, and actually go, go talk to people. When uh -huh. I, you, know, you, you wrote something I really like. It says, uh, why do we lose our childlike curiosity? What are the causes and what are the consequences? Most importantly, how do we get it back? Like, how do we get, you know, authentically curious to create relationship and to further our careers that way? Well, I, I think a lot of it is examining that, like what I'm saying, you know, is it fear? Is it assumptions? Is it technology? Is it which of these things is holding you back? And then once you recognize it, you could come up with tasks that help you network in a way that, overcomes those in a comfortable way at first, you know what I mean? Because you don't want to just jump in. Like for me, if you told me how to go to networking meeting at eight o'clock at night downtown, drive, you know, no, <laughs> I don't want to do it, right? But you tell me I could start by joining a little group in LinkedIn and I start talking there and maybe I go to, to a tweet chat thing where I start to, oh, okay, so I could do it on my, you know, an introvert might want that more or an extrovert would love the downtown Phoenix, I, even, you know, I'm an extrovert, but I'm not a night person, so that wasn't appealing to me. You, you have to find ways to um, figure out uh, the, the things that feel comfortable for you. And if they don't feel comfortable for you, analyze why. What is it that you don't like about networking? And what could it be that would make it different? So what would make, what have you uh, heard from your people who listen to the show of why they wouldn't like networking? Give so me I'll, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. I'm a, I'm a rabid introvert. I'm a very, very successful sales guy. Uh -huh. uh, but my, my empathy quotient is high. My connectivity, my connection uh, ability is high. So I was able to overcome a lot of the things that I didn't like about sales in that fashion. So mm -hmm. for networking, for me to go into a group of people, the energy is too much for me. I right. so, so what I have to do is first, I learn to breathe before I walk in the door. Second mm -hmm. is I have my questions for people, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so I have, I have, so I get myself curious. And third is I look for the person who looks like me, who's standing in the corner and not talking to anybody. And that's how I've gotten myself to go to networking meetings to learn how to talk to people. That's why cu your curiosity uh, code is so fascinating to me because that's, yeah. that's the entree into not having to be that interesting in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that what you're saying is, you know, that for introverts and extroverts, it's different, right? And Susan Cain's book, why it was unbelievable. Anybody who hasn't read it, it who's an introvert, it's a must read. And it really does shed a light on the value introverts add. And in sales, it's nice to see because we're seeing more um, empathy. We're seeing more listening skills, a lot of things out of introverts that we didn't see before. So I think she put a lot of value on what we were overlooking. Um, but, you know, there's different types of networking events. I mean, for, um, I, I think it helps sometimes to go to a networking event with somebody who makes you feel comfortable. And instead of just tackling it on your own, take an extrovert who you've gotten along with <laughs> with you. Done, and, done that. Yeah, it helps, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It's, uh, you, you know, they say, hey, help me meet people. And you know what I mean? And you start to listen to the things that they say. 
And you can emulate some of that if you have to. And I think introverts, just like extroverts, can do the opposite of what they are. It just drains them and then they go home and they're like, oh. I mean, it just depends. I mean, you've picked sales, for example, because you like sales. So there's going to be things about sales you don't like. I mean, I can remember when I was in sales sitting around a table and at pharmaceutical uh, meeting and everybody said what they liked best about the job. And I remember when everybody was saying, I was like, those are the things I hated the most. <laughs> and I'm thinking, that's what you like? You know, it was like driving. I'm driving. I don't hate to drive, you know, and that was like their favorite part of the day. And that's why I didn't like being a pharmaceutical rep, really, because it was driving. And so it's funny, you know, when you listen to what it is that people like about things, you just assume, you make all these assumptions that, well, everybody's thinking the same thing I'm thinking. And, and they're not. And I think um, it, having icebreakers, sometimes, like you said, having little things that you write on a card uh, that, to remind you of something to say is, can be helpful. I've had people just say funny pickup lines to me that were obviously over the top, you know, just to break the ice. I'm, I had a guy come up to me. He said, I'm getting married on Saturday. You want to be the bride? And <laughs> I thought, well, that's kind of funny. You know what I mean? Just that, was, that was disarming enough to get you. <laughs> yeah. Someone else might have gotten, might have gotten walked away on. But that, yeah, but that's... it was funny. You know what I mean? It was like, oh, yeah, it could be offensive, even a work thing. But I'm, I'm saying if you're in a setting to start with something that, is just obviously maybe over the top can sometimes break the ice if you feel comfortable doing that. But I, a lot of introverts don't. And obviously that guy was an extrovert. Uh, but <laughs> uh, I, I've had a lot of, um, I've had a lot of introverts that who, who, like you said, they'll look for other introverts and they'll start that way. I mean, it's got to start with baby steps. I think you can start with introverts and then you guys tackle it together. Sometimes it helps. I think there's power sometimes groups for those people that don't like that if it's a calm group <laughs> if you're not having an over-the-top person stress you out too much but sales it's part of the game and that's the problem for sales people uh, sometimes you have to play it everybody it's like Myers-Briggs you know you can be um, if you look at the the the, um, the introvert versus extrovert part of it, it it's like a you're, you're more comfortable with your right hand writing. It's not that you can't write with your left hand, it's just very uncomfortable. And it's the same thing with introvert, extrovert. It, it's a preference. And sometimes you could get better at it through time, but a lot of people just um, need the time away and to, to recoup and you know it, it can't be too much. And sometimes you, you find networking groups that maybe aren't in person, maybe there are other ways uh, to connect through people. And that's what's so great about LinkedIn is yeah. you can reach, you know, I think that's how we met, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm starting to make friends on LinkedIn, which I never thought possible. Yeah. Uh, now, see, LinkedIn, wonderful. Good, I, I agree. So it's, it's funny, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly happy being on stage in front of a thousand people, and I'm perfectly happy being in the kitchen talking to one person. Anything in between there, I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> so, so yeah. Shift gears. So I'm, I'm, the, I'm the head of an organization and I'm listening to this and I'm saying, you know, I really do want to foster more, more connection and more uh, everybody rowing in the same direction in my organization. And I want to cultivate my own curiosity and I want to make that part of the uh, evolving um, uh, culture of the organization. Where do okay. I start? Well, you have to start at the top, obviously. A lot of uh, leaders go to outside consultants. That's why I train so many consultants to uh, give the CCI. It's, um, this, the CCI is my curiosity code index, which is this the assessment I've been talking about. And w when you get somebody that gives that to the organization, it, it, it's helpful to your, your employees individually, but it's also helpful to you um, in, in another uh aspect of it because when I, when we come in and train what we do is we do a couple different uh, tra training um, exercises that the first one I have people do is uh, working on their individual fear assumptions technology environment issues right so they learn about curiosity and they, they start to develop all these skills to develop their own curiosity they have a action plan and measurable steps and not too different from like if you took an engagement survey how you'd have plans to every month work on different things but they also create uh, feedback for the trainer to give to leadership, which would really help anybody as a leader listening to this, that any of your issues that you have, critical thinking, engagement, all these things are the topics that we bring up in this other exercise. 
that now that they know how to deal with their own um, curiosity, they, they realize what they need for help. So they come up with tasks and um, different things that they think would be helpful to them to help them develop it if it's critical thinking, with all the different top things that they're, we're dealing with. And all of this feedback from everybody who takes these tr assessments goes through the trainer, you know, if it's a leadership consultant or HR professional, whoever's giving this class, then they compile all this information and give it to leadership. So leadership has all the answers right there. This is how I make my company more curious. I don't have to go and figure it out. It's, they've done it for me. I've got it in front of me, all this feedback. So the instructions are written on the people who are taking the test. Right, basically, yes. And so, you know, the people who take the test really know what they need. And leaders sometimes don't know how to get that feedback from them. And it's, a, it's kind of a scaffolding uh, process that we start off helping them in the training, um, the individuals learn about their own curiosity so that they can give the next level of feedback to leaders. This is what I need to get to this by you helping me with this assignment. So um, let's say if you wanted to get people to be critical thinkers, for example. Uh, I might say, okay, if you want me to be a better critical thinker, then maybe let me present a topic that I feel comfortable t presenting at a meeting for people who don't know about this topic. And uh, no better way for me to learn about something a little bit more than to teach it. So I come up with a PowerPoint presentation or whatever it is that, you know, you start at baby steps, the first thing that makes you comfortable, but you're learning about how to gather information and you're learning about how to present it in a way that you're, you're being persuasive and you develop those critical thinking skills, but you've given leaders a task to give you that'll help you in a way that you're comfortable, but it still develop that skill. And what, so, so tell me what the results have been. Well, you know, we just launched it, but you know, so it's, we don't have any long term. So I'm not talking about data. I'm talking about what do you, but when you, when you increase people's curiosity, mm -hmm. what do you see oh. the shift is? Oh, well, you know, curiosity is a spark to motivation, to drive, to, to, to the next level of all these things that we're talking about. So wow. it's why, is, why, is, why is that? It's science. I mean, we've proven it that that's just uh, our, it's a trait within us. We have this need for, we get a sense of dopamine rushes to us when we're curious and that gets us motivated. That, I mean, and then we decide, oh, well, <clears throat> I'll look into this. And then as we become interested in things that improves our engagement and that improves our critical thinking, it, it, it's all tied into this spark. But the end result is then you become more productive if you fix all these issues that we've been talking about. And then yeah. you become more, more innovative. And with those two things, that's what everybody's trying to do right now. We want to be more innovative because AI is going to be taken over and a lot of jobs, a lot of people are going to be moved out of their jobs. They don't know where to go. Now you'll know where they're going to want to go. You'll, they'll discover their curiosity really would have been better, uh, made them better suited for this job or that. And, you know, I've had people on my show where we talked about that in the past, we used to say, um, you know, well, if there's a computer, then we'll need a computer operator, right? So there's a new job being created. But now that it's becoming so exponential or, you know, there, that maybe there's a computer to operate the computer that we have to figure out different jobs. And I remember talking to a guest, I'm trying to remember who it was, but um, we were saying that, you know, we'll just create right now. We have things we don't even know we need that we don't really need, but there's we come up with, uh, we need a Starbucks. Well, we didn't really need a Starbucks. We want a Starbucks. So there's going to be all these things that they'll still, human uh, jobs will still be there because we'll create jobs based on what we think we need. So, you know, all this is, is all tied into improving this innovative mind. And if you don't realize the importance of innovation, I mean, that's going to be the downfall of any of these companies is because they're going to turn into blockbusters and you know we really want to increase that innovative thinking so that we are around for one thing and but it's also helping on productivity and you know just being com competitive and staying in the marketplace I think so I, I and and that that's the premise of why I, I, I put this podcast together is because not only innovation for companies but innovation for ourselves as AI comes as things change as we age as if we don't innovate, if we don't evolve and learn how to be more curious, you know, emotional intelligence, when you had a job that you knew you were going to have, you didn't have to care about emotional intelligence. Now you have to real, now you have to expand in order to be able to stay viable in the workplace longer, as far as I can tell. 
Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. I took a test in the 80s uh, for a job, uh, which they were really kind of ahead of their time. They gave us a personality test and, and they also every year rated us on our concern for impact and in sales. And it's, that's really how much you care, how you come across to other people. Those are your interpersonal skills, your empathy, all the things that are in emotional intelligence and uh, just self-awareness. Do you care? And so I think that that's a huge part of um, developing uh, as a human being is to recognize the importance of emotional intelligence because it can be developed. And that's the good news. And, <laughs> and we're finding that uh, as people develop, they're becoming better leaders. I mean, Daniel Goldman's work is iconic. I mean, just everything about him is just amazing. If you could read any of his leadership research and, and, and any of his work is just really important. All of, you know, that's the greatest thing about having these shows. Like, you know, I just get to interview just the most amazing minds. I even uh, interviewed Albert Bandera this week. I mean, this father, he's like the genius of psychology who's second sighted to Freud, right? So, you know, I talk to these people um, about just their insights and what they've learned. I and mean, he's 90, he's going to be 94 this year, you know, and just what he's seen in his life. And, and, it, everything that I've researched for curiosity and, and perception and emotional intelligence, it, it all, um, I just feel very validated when I talk to them because I'm like, oh, good. <laughs> That's, I'm glad that I am on the right track, right? Because I, I really think that this is important. I mean, I, I'm such a nerd researcher. I mean, you, you know, PhDs, we, we analyze everything to death, but I, Actually, I, I, it's one of the things I admire. So when you know, I follow you on LinkedIn and I'm just, and I watch you go from subject to subject and, and, and you've, you've done the research, you've read the book, you've, yeah. you know, you've, you've read the paper and then you're able to alchemize it and bring it out into the world. So I find that very admirable. Oh, so, thank you. so where do, where do you want to take this, um, your, your CCI? Well, right now, you know, my book is required reading around the world. It's in MBA programs in Africa. And it's, it's I mean, it just launched a couple of few weeks ago. So that's pretty good for the first few weeks. And the, um, the CCI is available there. Everything's available at curiositycode.com. So they we'll, take, we'll put the links in the show notes for you. Great. Uh, but they could take the, uh, the, the assessment there. They don't have to go through training to take the assessment. They can do it on their own. But if they go through training in, in a corporate setting, they'll get much more of that, what I'm talking about with the leadership uh, uh, programs and all that. But, you know, we're certifying people to be CCI certified. So if any people are consultants or HR professionals listening to that, um, we're, we're offering um, five hours of SHRM recertification credit. They get all kinds of stuff for, you know, being uh, CCI certified. And it's making them be very relevant right now. Um, everybody wants to be relevant, right? If it, I mean, my show, who I have on next, right after this, I'm interviewing Brian Salas, who is just everything's a futurist, uh, innovative thinker of the world. He's a genius, right? And that he, those guys are really forecasting what we need to do, what we're, we need to be thinking about. And, and that's what I'm trying to do is keep us ahead of the, the thing, uh, of everything. And as leaders, we want to just... Uh, you know, be a little kinder on ourselves and how we think about things and realize everybody's got that voice in their head telling them they're not good enough and they all think that they're going to be exposed and all these kinds of things. But, you know, if you just embrace it, I think that humble quality is kind of appealing. And I think the ones that try to be a puffer fish are, are, look worse than the ones that, who just say, hey, you know, I can't know everything. And that's why I surround myself with the best people. That's beautiful. And, and, and I think, and I really believe that curiosity is the shortcut to all of those things. You can learn emotional intelligence. You can learn all these things, all these skills. If you just get curious, you can cut through in so many ways for a relationship, for, for critical thinking, for, you know, for innovation. And it's really, it's really a, a brilliant thing you've, you've, you've uh, stumbled onto and, and perfected. So I'm glad that you were able to talk with us. Thank you. I'll put all, all this information. There was a chuck full of information that'll all go in the show notes so you can go do all your research to your heart's content. Diane, thank you for being on the show. I appreciate it and showing me how to do it. It's amazing. Uh, to everybody else, thank you for spending time with us. Uh, uh, if you like the show, please like it, share it, leave us a review. I love you and have a great rest of the day.